Hello and thank you for listening to the Advise You Podcast, episode 14, comparing Division One and Division Two academics. And I have not recorded an episode in a while. It's been crazy as uh, many of you that are listening are athletic academic advisors or work in higher education. The first couple weeks of school, uh, leading up to school, and the first couple weeks are uh, very busy. So my full commitment was there to my my day-to-day job and um, so now I am back with a couple episodes today's the first one back where I'm going to kind of take you through division one and division two academics for those that understand my background I worked really a balanced uh, career in d1 and d2 so far with academics um, and doing NCAA certification eligibility uh, in those cases so what I really wanted to do is kind of compare both see how um, they're not as different as uh, one might think uh, for those of you that might see job postings that are listening and you see a division one or a division two it might say we want division one experience division two well today's episode is really going to compare what is the same and what is different and maybe if you are applying for a job like that you can get something out of it by kind of explaining uh, to the employer or the way you word your cover letter or resume that the terminology and the consensus of the rules are pretty much the same. Um, So we're just going to go through the subtle differences and um, I'll kind of give you a little bit uh, insight from that from my current and previous roles. And something else happened over the last, since last time I recorded episode 13, I found out I was appointed to the Division II Academic Requirements Committee for the next four years. Um, so what that means is there's, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about Division II in the future, um, especially with academics. I'll never talk about anything um, about committee work. Um, that's not really what the co- podcast is about anyways, as, as those of you who have listened to the previous episodes, it's, it's heavily focused on Division I academic pol- policy, and um, I try to keep just my, my day job uh, away from my, uh, my podcast, and um, so that's just for full transparency that I am very excited about being on that role. That is kind of the national um, membership for all of Division II academic requirements, so very excited about that and working on a couple of subcommittees, um, but I will never speak about the committee. Um, definitely none of my committee work, and uh, that's to be expected, I would hope, but just putting that out there for full transparency. And before we get started, uh, I want to start doing this thing where, uh, for those of you that listen to this, you probably read a lot too. I, th- I feel like people that listen to podcasts enjoy reading. Um, so I am going to each episode now try to talk about a book that I've read or that I am reading that I'm really getting something out of that I think could be relevant to uh, my assumed listeners. Uh, and today's episode, I want to focus on political risk. And this is really something that we could get out of uh, for higher education and uh, NCAA. I listened to the audio book, which is great. It's Political Risk, How Businesses and Organizations Can Anticipate Global Insecurity. Connelisa Rice and Amy Zegart um, both on the, uh, are both kind of take this book uh, as their classroom. So they work on um, a lot of case studies and they go through current events and they put their class uh, through these current events and what they would do to react. And I don't know about you all, but um, undergrad, I didn't get a lot of those types of experiences. But grad school, it was really heavy on case studies. And anytime you can actually uh, integrate a project in, I think it helps. But this really helps with, um, with anyone in today's environment. It talks a lot about social media, um, decision making. But any policy that you could think of, and I think higher education is definitely one that um, opens up to a lot of risk with politics, and I think NCAA does as well. I'm actually uh, going to, I bought this one because I like it so much that I'm going to gift it to someone at the NCAA um, that I think could use it, uh, or a department at least that might be interested in it. And um, I think uh, you all get a lot out of it. The audiobook is not, uh, Condoleezza Rice does not do the audiobook. But uh, if you want to get on audible.com, I know uh, this is not a sponsorship, but uh, they give you a free download for your first uh, creation of an account. So, I mean, it's a pretty easy listen. It's interesting because it is relevant. It's a brand new book um, or pick it up at your local bookstore. Um, So every week now with the podcast, I'm going to try and put a book out there uh, that I think the listener could get a lot out of. All right. So. Some basic stats, and you'll notice if you're watching the video, I've kind of converted to audio and video. Um, you'll see behind me on my whiteboard that really just put a lot of the stats out there um, for 
comparing the D1 and D2, trying to make it easy, and I'll try to stay out of the way with the camera. Um, but the kind of makeup of Division One and Division Two, uh, it's it's different in a way. I mean, I worked at a small D2, I've worked at a big D2, I've worked at a medium and a large D1. Now, education, everyone knows school types are different, um, but these are sheer numbers. So, Division One, there's 351 Division One full membership schools versus 308 for Division Two. Division Three is actually the biggest membership institution, but the podcast doesn't really focus on that um, because Division Three's academic policies are essentially just follow the university protocol. Now, uh, the average undergraduate enrollment, and these numbers are all pulled from NCAA.org, is 9,629 students versus 2,485 for Division Two. Now, that's a big difference. Um, I, th- I work at schools that are bigger than that, but I've definitely uh, been to and seen, and our teams have competed against much s- smaller Division Two schools. And uh, you'll see a lot of private liberal arts type schools our division two and that is a uh, that in my opinion kind of leads to why some of the uh, rules are different for academics um, and I'll kind of get to that uh, in a little bit another one that is interesting is one in 25 students at a division one campus on average is a student athlete versus one in 11 at a division two my current institution it's about 12 uh, percent I would say um, of the student population are student athletes so very uh, very big difference there. I mean, if you're at a smaller school and there's a lot of sports um, that maybe Division One schools, some of them don't have, um, but you'll see that if you're on campus at a D2, you're going to know a lot of athletes. You're going to see a lot of student athletes. And um, 59% of student athletes at Division One are receiving some type of athletic scholarship. And 62% at Division Two student athletes are receiving some type of athletic scholarship. So um, that kind of goes with just a random myth that everyone's on a full ride. I can tell you the majority of student athletes are not on a full ride, D1 or D2, um, and that is uh, definitely the case. Uh, I like seeing it similar. I mean, it shows that we're giving a percentage away equally uh, for Division One, Division Two, And then uh, I want to talk first about initial eligibility, then I'll talk about continuing eligibility, then I'll wrap up with just a couple of uh, measurements and comments. Um, But the biggest thing to pull from initial eligibility is they follow the same process as far as the eligibility center, but what they do differently is they have slightly different rules. Now the membership and the presidents, they all vote on the membership rules, and what's interesting is Division 1 in 2016 changed their academic standards, and it was a huge deal. ESPN was writing articles about it. Coaches were up in arms about this is going to ruin college athletics because because uh, students aren't going to be able to catch up in time. They're not going to adjust. And um, there's in the Committee on Academics or Division One, they they published a report not too long ago that very small difference in numbers as far as non qualifiers um, coming out for Division One. And it's really not a big difference in my opinion because students are going to adjust. The biggest thing is trying to get the out the uh, the community involved as far as getting these institutions to go out to their high schools in the areas that they recruit and putting it on coaches to also recruit and tell the high schools, remind them about the the NCAA academic changes. Now, Division II this year started uh, entering 2018. If you're a freshman, you're entering different rules. So um, I'm going to kind of take you through the rules, but you'll see how very common things are uh, for the eligibility center and initial eligibility standards. Now, the the first thing that I'll say about it is it's really going to come down to just a few things uh, for both Division One and Division Two. They're going to look at your test scores, like it or not. They're going to look at a sliding scale based on your um, test scores and GPA. They're going to look at core GPA, not just your cumulative. And they're going to look at your 16 core courses. Now, the difference here for Division One, Division Two for core courses is it's just a little bit different of what you have to meet in division one versus division two so that is the biggest issue and then obviously you have to graduate high school so that's the biggest thing so when you're looking up here on the chart or you're listening to me for division one for the core gpa you have to have a 2.3 so if you ever attend the national office or you see a commercial about preparing high school or initial eligibility it'll say 2.3 or take a knee and that's kind of the 
the slogan that they've chosen um, with this change. If you go to the NCAA Hall of Champions downtown Indianapolis, um, you will see it's plastered with 2.3 or take a knee um, graphics, uh, students being on a bench, on a, um, not being able to be on the court, on the sideline, things like that to really emphasize that 2.3. Now, Division Two, you have to have a 2.2 core GPA. And the reason why they went to core GPA, and yes, it does take a little bit more uh, to calculate, um, but it's so that they're actually taking subjects that are college ready. So they're helping prepare for college. Um, that really helps uh, instead of just taking, you know, the, the different subjects that certain high schools might have. They're, they're just easy A, show up classes. They want to see significant work it's not to make it more difficult it's to help students prepare and focus on academics before they get to college i could spend a whole episode talking about why actually i kind of did uh a couple episodes ago talk about why it's important for um for the NCAA to do this and why higher education needs to be a little more focused on core classes instead of just uh submitting your transcript when you apply to college and looking at regular gpa I think it'd be a lot easier if people would just focus on core GPA, core courses. Now, the other thing is these sliding skills. So I have done an episode about this, about the sliding skills. I actually like them a lot. So uh, if you want to get on AdviseU.com, and you can look at the NCAA Academics page where I link up, uh, for one, I link up the D1 and D2 academic pages from the NCAA.org, but I also have um, a screen grab picture of the sliding scales. Now, the NCAA Research Staff, AMA, Committee on Academics or Academic Requirements Committee, they can look at those sliding skills to see if it needs updated. Um, but for the most part, um, it's on there right now if you want to take a look at it. Um, don't have it on the board, obviously, but it's essentially where, based on your GPA that you have, your core GPA, this is what your test score has to be. So it shows you just looking at it across. Or am I in the good? Am I in the bad? Can I be eligible? Am I going to have to be a partial qualifier or, or a red shirt? Um, what have you? But both Division One, Division Two, use the same scale. It's a different scale, but they use the same concept of a scale. And so I think that is another thing higher education could benefit from to make admissions clear uh, for the whole eligibility center process. And then talking about progress towards a degree. This is probably the one that, from working at D1 and D2, I think it's a lot sim more similar than people realize, um, mainly because of the progress towards degree percentages that we hear about um, in Division I. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about with that is it's really not as different as someone might think. So let's look at this real quick if you're listening or watching at home. So the progress towards degree comes down to multiple things. It's going to be term credits annual credits and then progress towards degree percentages now what's uh unique is division two is uh kind of following in the same footsteps without the percentage so i'll talk about the um the baseline credit things first basically a term credit if you're and i'm going to use credit hours so if you're on a quarter system there's a conversion for that as well in the in the rule book um, but for progress towards degree continuing eligibility each semester in Division One, you have to pass six credits for APR. If you are a football player in Division One, then you have to pass nine credits or you risk a suspension. In Division Two, everyone has to pass nine. So instead of the six hour rule, it's the nine hour rule. Now here's the catch with Division One. If you just constantly earn six each time, you're gonna be ineligible for the next year because they each have an 18 hour rule uh, for the two semesters, meaning you can't use summer, you can't use a, a, a mid-May term, whatever, a Jan term. You can't use those. It has to be in semester one and two, did you earn 18 credits? So that's, uh, that's common in both of them. For division two, obviously, if you do nine and nine, you're still 18. If you're doing six and six, you're obviously short of 18. You're going to be ineligible if you're division one. Now, what's next is the annual. So not just the school year, but this can include summer. So everyone in Division One has to, or excuse me, I should break it down first. If you are going into your sophomore year, you have to have earned 24 credits, and that is the same as Division Two. Every year in Division Two, you have to earn 24 for the year. Um, obviously, um, 18 during the school year, and then you can use six more to get to the 24 in summer school. So, uh, or summer or midterm or May term, Jan term, whatever. Um, that can go towards the 24, but not to the 18. 
Now, why it's different in Division One is entering your junior year, you have to be meeting percentages. So going into junior year, you have to be at 40%. Going into the following year, it's 60, and then the following year, it's 80. So keep in mind, the NCAA rules are both for Division One and Division Two. The minimum standards are set on a five-year clock. So if you're only earning 24 a year, that's going to get to 120 after five years. So then you're going to get your degree, which most schools are around 120. So the biggest thing about this percentage is if you're constantly just barely meeting that percentage, you're going to be on a five-year plan. Now look at this. The If we take 120 credit, so 40% of 120 is 48 credits. So going into your junior year, you have to have 48 credits, degree credits for Division One. Division two, you're going to be at 48 if you've gotten 24 each year. And then it goes up just like that. So every year with these percentages, when you go from 40, 60, to 80, all you're doing is adding 24 credit requirements to the year. Now, the difference is kind of with Division One and Division Two is Division One, you can't really manipulate too much a percentage without changing a major. And that's where some people think that steering majors come in is because they're trying to get percentages. Now, Division Two, you're doing an annual, you get a redo every year. So you could change your major every year and you could still be eligible if you're meeting the credit hour rules. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be at 40, 68 percent of your degree if you're a D2 student athlete, because you could not graduate at all after 10 years if you keep changing your major. So the point of Division One is they're really trying to push staying on this track every year and accumulating credits towards their degree. Division two, they're kind of already assuming at these schools that they're doing that. And this is where it comes into play when I talked about um, D2 schools being smaller, liberal arts schools. What comes with a smaller school is a smaller offering of classes, a smaller offering of majors. Um, so you're really kind of focused on just putting it in the hands of the academic advisors and the students uh, and the faculty to make sure that they're getting out of here with a degree. So there's not as many options. So I think that's something that leads to helping Division II. Um, the other thing is, is it's not a huge issue, in my opinion, to if Division I just went to the 24 every year. Um, I think it's good that there's, a, a, there's something tied to it that they have to be accumulating credits. But if anything would relax the rules, I think Division I um, could relax that rule. But they're not going to, and the reason is because graduation rates are going up through the roof uh, for all types of student athletes, so they're not going to. If anything, would D2 ever go to that model? I don't know. I don't want to comment on it just because of my, uh, my new committee appointment, but I think uh, that's the biggest misconception, though, is that they're completely different when they're really not because, like I said, if you earn 24 every year, you're going to hit that 40, 60, 80. 100% degree and then if you're division two you have to be hitting 24 anyways so the biggest difference is really the the term by term credit hours and then just the percentage so that change of major you can go through the waiver process of your division one and you go through that a PTD waiver um, but not a lot of differences here and I think that is what's interesting to me is if you see job postings and they assume that it's completely different these progress towards degree rules they're not that different um, I think that one thing that it does help with is it opens up the opportunity for academic misconduct if you're um, if you're trying to be a D2 student athlete where you're just trying to regularly be eligible then that could be a concern but I don't think that that's uh, that's to a dire point yet where they have to address um, address this these requirements they're better than nothing um, and I think that higher education, there's really no incentive for higher education other than getting your financial aid taken away um, to regularly be pro progressing towards graduation. So Division One, Division Two, what have you, they're both doing the same thing, just there's not a percentage tied to it. And then the GPA, this one is not really a huge issue. Um, quite frankly, I'm surprised Division One has uh, doesn't just adopt the 2.0 rule like the NCAA Division Two has. But basically in Division One, it's it's a percentage tied to the lowest acceptable GPA in your program to graduate. But there's a little exception in there where you actually use the lowest one in any degree on campus, which most schools, it's a 2.0. Some, it can go all the way up to a 2.5. But it's based on a breakdown where um, it starts at 90%, um, then 95%, and then the last two years, 
it has to be at 100% of that minimally accepted GPA for Division One. Division Two, every certification period entering the fall annually or whenever you get certified, you have to have a 2.0 no roundup. Uh, so it's just cut and dry. Now this is cumulative, so it it does come with some possible GPA manipulation, both in Division One and Division Two, which is it's interesting. I think it's you know there's in high school we only take core GPA for both Division One and Division Two uh, initial eligibility. We require transferable GPA for um, NCAA academics for incoming transfers. But for our continuing eligibility students, we only hold them accountable for the actual uh, cumulative GPA. So if anything, this is more educational, but this is kind of opinionative right here is, if we really want to uh, focus on that, I think one thing Division One might want to look at, since they're very selective on what type of credits they'll accept for um, progress towards degree, is maybe we should have to count GPAs for only progress towards degree classes. That I think could go a long way in, um, in taking too many PE classes or things like that that kind of uh, make people think of what's called the eligibility machine. I think that uh, would just be a lot more work for other everyone, but um, if we're looking at kind of treating the rules the same way, that's something that Division One might eventually get to. Uh, we can do more on that uh, some other time, but um, GPA manipulation is kind of a big thing. Now, the other thing that I don't think is, is seen as much at Division Two or not paid closely enough to um, is probably the fact that degree credits uh, have to be degree applicable, hence the word degree credits. So whenever you see terminology or explaining NCAA academic rules, they're going to look at, they're probably going to be calling it degree credits, not just credits. So I should have been doing that too, but basically you get a freebie in your first year. Anything can count, including remedial coursework. Semester two, or excuse me, your second year remedial cannot count, but everything else is still degree applicable. Then you all of a sudden go into your junior year. And so for division one and division two, anything after that have to be degree applicable courses. And so where this comes into play that you have to watch out at D1 and D2 is insufficient grades, repeating insufficient grades, repeating the same classes, and then the amount of electives. So I think um, Division One, the percentages, the fact that you have to do PT percentage has probably made people pay closer attention to degree applicability than at some D2 institutions uh, where it might be harder because you're, you're not required to do the percentage. So it might be a little more difficult for you to be tracking um, every semester is the not are the nine credits degree applicable or the 18 the 24 are they all degree applicable courses and that would be probably the closest thing that you would need to worry about as far as degree applicable and progress towards degree and continuing eligibility and then the last thing that I'll mention is graduation rates so graduation rates I think everyone in higher education agrees that the federal graduation rate FGR is not a good modernized uh, method to track mostly because of transfers um, there's a lot of transferring in college probably gonna keep doing that um, so what the problem is that the transfers aren't factored in uh, for the institution's uh, uh, graduation rate so division one division two each have their own graduation methods so the biggest thing is for um, the graduation success rate, which is GSR, and that's for Division One, they are including transfers in and out. And we've talked about this before, um, definitely at regional rules. If you've ever attended there, they talk, they do sessions about transferring and graduation rates. But basically, if you have a certain GPA, which I believe it's 2.6 cumulative GPA, and your student athlete is um, would have been eligible coming back they can actually leave and you won't get the APR hit or the graduation success rate hit. So you actually are not penalized because they left in good academic standing. They would have been eligible. Um, and then you can also count transfers that come into your institution and graduate from your institution. So it's a, it's trying to be a better way of tracking uh, the pathway of the student and just following them around um, and trying to get data on it. Now the Division II has what's called the ASR, the Academic Success Rate. Biggest difference is here, it also includes transfers, uh, mid-year enrollees, and it also includes non-athletic scholarship student athletes. Um, so that's one thing that I think is gonna improve it that maybe Division One needs to look at is, hey, if you're gonna have them on your roster and we're gonna make them meet all these requirements, maybe eventually, especially when you tie in the, um, 
the uh, academic money that's going to be coming through the distribution. Maybe everyone for graduation rate and APR um, is included instead of just scholarship athletes. Because one thing I don't particularly like about that for Division One is that you can manipulate and improve balloon your scores by throwing book money at a Division One student athlete and calling him, uh, him or her on scholarship, athletic scholarship. Um, so I think. Uh, I think eventually that's one thing I like about the D2 one um, that I think Division One might have to go through eventually. And then the last thing um, I did mention um, kind of governance, membership governance, uh, that I was on the academic uh, requirements committee now. Uh, I, f I talk quite a bit about the Division One committee on academics. That's something that um, I like reading their minutes. You can see a lot of uh, the, the every time they meet, they go over data points, they go over legislation. Um, I like that uh, aspect of it. I think D1 uh, and D2 do a good job of leveraging their uh, staff at the national office for AMA, Academic Membership Affairs, and the NCAA research staff, and then obviously report to the Board of Governors. Um, but Division One, they use the Committee on Academics. Division Two, Academic Requirements Committee, um, to kind of be the membership uh, response uh, on issues uh, that are not national office staff, but actually people that are faculty, administrators, um, student athletes at these uh, D1, D2 institutions. So that's all I have for today's episode. I will encourage you to go to advisedu.com. That's A-D-V-I-S-E-D-U.com. And you can catch all the episodes there. This will be um, the 14th episode and uh, the 15th episode coming soon. And you can see all the episode notes, the links to certain materials that I talk about. And there is new and exciting content underway to enhance the video and audio reach of Advise You. Uh, it's going to include more interviews, in-person interviews, and TED Talk-like videos. So a kind of a 15, 20-minute um, TED style video for both innovation and opinions and then also rules education um, uh, examples to kind of be just not a ongoing podcast but they just be on there as kind of a video library and um, finally go to contact page on the advise you site if you have something you want to hear about between ncaa academics and higher education uh, with a focus on division one and follow me on twitter at travis higher ed and that's all I have for you today. So thank you for being patient between episodes and understanding uh, the last month. I'm sure most of you have been uh, crazy busy at work. So hopefully you're getting a good time uh, now that we're back in. All of our student athletes are here. We're starting to go to fall sporting events, and uh, we're all having fun with it. So thank you for listening to the Advise You podcast, and have a nice day.